Hello, everyone. This is Peter Zemsky, INSEAD Strategy Professor and Deputy Dean, coming to you live from INSEAD's um, campus in Fontainebleau, France. Lovely um, summer day here. Um, we've got a super timely topic, DeFi, a digital revolution in finance. Um, a lot, a lot going on in the space. Great speaker who will help us understand what's going on, where do we go from here, hype from reality. Um, again, so this is a uh, fascinating space. We thought it would be good before I bring Alex out, um, just to give him a sense of where you are as an audience. So the first is just a warm up poll. Um, really, how familiar are you with crypto and blockchain? This is multiple choice. So just um, select any and all of these that might appeal, uh, might be true about you. So uh, just help us. Gage, super, uh, super curious what the INSEAD uh, thing looks like. So about a third of you own cryptocurrencies, about 10% are in NFTs, about 12% working in DeFi. We're looking forward to some great questions from you um, and 21% um, in blockchain, but half the audience is really here to learn about a new area. So that is noted. Um, all right, so how are we gonna make progress on this? So let me introduce our great speaker, Alex Tapscott. Really, um, Alex, internationally recognized. Um, hey, Alex, good to see you. Thanks for coming out. You get to listen up as I talk about you. So again, internationally recognized writer, speaker, investor, advisor um, in this whole space around technology, but really gone deep now on, on blockchain, crypto, thinking not only about business, um, but also society and government. Um, well known as co-founder of Toronto-based Blockchain Research Institute with his father, Don Tapscott. Um, I got to know, and NCI got to know Alex and Don because we teamed up with BRI to launch really the first big MOOC specialization on blockchain for the enterprise back in summer of 2019. Um, we'll hear more about what, what um, Alex is up there, but he holds various positions, chair of the advisory council, Prophecy DeFi, managing director of digital asset group, Nine Point Partners. Um, later, we'll talk about his, um, his books and his authoring. Um, so Alex, welcome back to INSEAD. And uh, maybe just, again, with half the people somewhat um, not deep in the space, how do you like to define briefly DeFi and, and, and why is it a potential big revolution in finance? Well, first, thanks, Peter, so much for hosting me. It's great to see you again and to be collaborating in this way. The poll results were, I think, pretty illuminating because people, I think in general, consider this technology as being somewhat um, early stage and maybe not widely used or widely known, but the results of that poll um, would contradict that. Now, of course, this is a, a group that's self-selected for a discussion about crypto and is uh, made up of you know a lot of INSEAD individuals and alums. So perhaps it may be over-indexing towards crypto, uh, but still great to see so many people who are uh, interested in this space. Um, the reason I think that uh, there's so much interest in, in DeFi is that financial services as an industry um, is one of the last sort of bastions that has not been truly impacted by um, technology in, in a meaningful way. Now, it's true that we interact with you know, applications on our phone and fintechs have made um, a lot of financial services more convenient. Um, but fundamentally, the big intermediaries and institutions that have dominated the industry in the past, uh, like banks, continue to do so today. Uh, what DeFi promises essentially is to replace many of the aspects of financial services um, with software and specifically with open source uh, permissionless software, meaning basically that anyone anywhere in the world with an, with an internet connection can get access to it. Um, DeFi would not be possible um, if it weren't for Bitcoin and the invention um, of the underlying technology of, of blockchain. Um, Bitcoin, I think a lot of people are familiar with at this point, was, uh, was designed to do something you know, very simple. It was designed to be cash for the internet. Um, well, if Bitcoin was a way to move value peer to peer, then DeFi is basically reimagining every aspect of the financial industry, not just how we move it, but how we store value, how we access credit, how we get um, you know, exposure to investments, how we uh, transact and exchange in financial assets, how we raise growth capital, um, how we insure against risk, how we organize financial information, um, audit and account for it. So all of those different functions 
are being reimagined by uh, software. And that's a really big shift. Um, and as a result is, you know, captured the imagination of lots of people. So, you know, so clearly deep digitalization, maybe just explain a little bit more why decentralized? What, again, you, you sort of contrasted what's happening here with these big centralized incumbents, but, but a little bit, what's the technology allowing on decentralization? Yeah, well, basically this would, this is all really possible um, not only because of the invention of, of blockchains, which for those who aren't familiar, a blockchain is a uh, decentralized ledger of transactions in a system of some kind. So in traditional finance, it's banks and other intermediaries that maintain uh, you know, the books, that maintain the ledger of transactions, who owns what, who owes what to whom, and so forth. Uh, a blockchain is a decentralized ledger meaning basically that anyone anywhere can see and access that information, but no single entity uh, can change it. The only way that it can be changed is with the consensus of the network. So basically it's a trusted record of mm -hmm. transactions in, in any given network um, that everyone can rely upon. So that's sort of invention number one. Invention number two is a thing called the smart contract. So something that probably a lot of people on the, on the call are familiar with. A smart contract basically um, automates decision making um, using software. So in traditional finance and law, we have these agreements that uh, parties enter into that are enforced by courts that involve, uh, you know, intermediaries like banks to uh, execute payments, escrow agents and so forth. A smart contract takes all of that um, sort of business logic and compresses it into a piece of code. So um, basically you can uh, program sort of any kind of agreement into code. So what does that mean for financial services? Well, in the case of DeFi, it could mean uh, getting access to credit. So with lending protocols like Compound and Aave, uh, individuals can basically, uh, what is effectively lock up assets and get credit against those assets. Um, and that could be for lots of reasons. It could be because they're looking to buy more of the same asset, like a margin account, you know, using uh, it is a way to get uh, leverage to buy more assets, or it could be used to pay for your day-to-day -day lifestyle because you don't want to take a big capital gain in a crypto asset that's uh, up a lot, or you know, it could be for some other reason. Uh, but the key thing is that the entire process of, of putting money into the contract, getting access to the credit, and then the contract actually liquidating you if your collateral drops beneath a certain level, all happens using code. Normally, the way that would work is that you'd have to open a bank account, then you'd have to open a brokerage account, then you'd have to um, open a margin account, and then you would, you know, buy assets, take out margin, and then you would, um, you know, borrow that money, and then you would get a call from the broker saying you've got to top up your margin account, otherwise we're going to start liquidating your account, and then you would get liquidated, and then so there's all these different steps that involve like people and banks and all this stuff. All that just happens like in an instant using code. So that's one example. Another example are peer-to-peer. Uh, decentralized exchanges. So I think most people are familiar with the concept of, uh, you know, of an exchange. They started in Amsterdam um, to trade shares of the East India Company. Uh, but you know, in the modern exchange we think of as sort of like the New York Stock Exchange, the Nasdaq. Um, you know, these are highly automated um, entities. They're not still trading paper receipts under a tree somewhere, but they are still fundamentally centralized. Um, and that's true also has been true historically for crypto as well. So the biggest exchanges in the world, companies that are well known like Coinbase and Binance and others are still fundamentally centralized order books where you know buyers and sellers meet and then uh, transactions occur on these platforms. A decentralized exchange is different. Um, the biggest one is a thing called Uniswap. Uniswap is a basically a, a, an open source protocol where individuals, buyers and sellers can enter into transactions voluntarily um, in assets and um, do so peer to peer. Now there's a lot of technology and that's happening in the background to create the liquidity and conditions for that to work. But basically the idea is that you've got asset A, I want to, that you want to sell and so-and-so has, has money they want to buy. You can swap into those transactions. All that is happening using software. So Uniswap, the concept of a decentralized exchange has adva advanced quite rapidly in the last couple of years. So that today, uh, on many days, Uniswap actually does more volume than Coinbase does. And I think people think of Coinbase as a huge company. Well, this decentralized protocol actually handles more transactions and certainly does uh, trades in way more names. It has got a lot more market depth. All right, that's Sorry. great. So I'm going to slow you down there. So again, just for the audience, we want to do two things. I think one 
is probe deeper on all the stuff Alex Alex just laid out there. How are you actually creating value? You know, what, what what's the fundamentals here? Why does this make sense? Why can this technology win in the long run? And 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 then at the same time, how is it actually playing out today? Because you know, Alex, as you say, that's it, it is this kind of new thing. You talk to people in the space, they're like, oh, this is like early internet. And yet, in November 2021, there were like three trillions of assets at, at current valuations, and, and clearly, um, which had shot up, you know, quite a bit in, in in the 18 months before. And now we've lived through this this you know substantial correction. Um, so I, I would just just to to bring that in. Obviously, people read about these things. The you know the the stablecoin meltdown, like like 40 billion. From, from Luna and, and Terra USD, or then you start reading about some of these, these more centralized entities actually like, like Three Arrow or Celsius going under. So before I get your initial read on that, let's go back to the audience. Let's pull up our second poll. Um, again, this is for, for everyone, especially those of you who are, are following the space, but what are you thinking? You know, For those, maybe if we're thinking about investing, so let's just take it as given that we've gone from three trillion to one trillion. Obviously, how you 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 value that has has some complexity. But you can see your options. Are you someone who sees this as coming back, moderate recovery um, through to you know total wipeout? I guess that would be zero. Asteroid hits us and there's nothing left. Um, and but there is that deep dark winter at two fifty billion. Um, so more pain to come. And then and then Alex will uh, just get your reflections again. Not not so much at first on where things are going, but what the heck has happened? And, and then of course, what does it mean? How are we doing, Sandra? Are we getting some answers? Guys, all right, here we go. Just don't necessarily invite, all right, here we go. So, um, wow, so uh, yeah, there, there is a, quite a spread just uh, for those, a quarter of you are true believers as it were, it's coming back 16%, another one sixth or more on the optimistic side. Um, Again, there's only maybe 15% who are really um, bearish on this. Okay, Alex, what do you make of the current dynamics in, in the crypto and DeFi space? Well, it's true that the price of the entire crypto assets or the market cap of the entire um, crypto asset space hit a high of $3 trillion and today sits around $1 trillion. That's correct. Um, and I think that uh, price is an important measure of investor interest. And if you're you know, a, a short-term speculator or you're in it to make money, um, then that's something that should concern you. But that's not only one of you know, a dozen different indicators that you can look at to, for the health of, of a new technology or a new industry. Um, what's really fascinating about crypto as an asset class is that there's a market for everything. Um, every single project, whether it's you know a large and established protocol like Bitcoin or Ethereum or something that's very early stage, um, has a native token. Now some of them are pre-launched; they don't yet have a token. But the vast majority of projects within you know an early period of their life cycle have a market capitalization. So you can do this daily, uh, and even you know tick by tick, um, mark to market uh, of of what the valuation is of the entire market. That hasn't been true historically for, for most technology cycles. Often um, a lot of the early stage development happens in the private market. Um, you know, if you could have done a, a mark to market on private tech stocks during, you know, prior cycles, you probably would have seen at, at least as great a drawdown, if not more. So it's important to understand that um, bull and bear markets happen in asset classes all the time. And that's um, sometimes a sign of the health of that ecosystem. Um, and in the short run could mean a lack of access to capital funding or maybe, mm. you know, lack of uh, adoption. But in the long run, it's generally not a great indicator. You know, everyone talks about the, the dot com crash. And uh, what's interesting is that, you know, in, in 2000 to 2001, around five trillion dollars, uh, four and a half to five trillion dollars was wiped off of um, global indices, well, specifically the Nasdaq. Um, and if in today's dollars, that's maybe 10 or 10 or 12 trillion dollars. Um, so in the context of the dot-com crash, um, the current crypto, um, you know, correction is, is a blip, uh, honestly. Um, yeah. but, but, e but even still, that's not the, even the right, that's only one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is that a lot of the, you know, businesses, the much maligned businesses of the dot-com era, whether they were, you know, early social networking apps or, you know, um, you know uh, e-commerce platforms. Pet food, pet food in your mail. 
<laughs> yeah, sure, pet food in your mail or whatever, you know, were, were derided at the time. But of course, like those are, that's who, who buys pet food at the pet store, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. All of the businesses of the dot-com era uh, either exist today or would exist today, uh, given the tech to technology tools that are available. Maybe what we needed was, you know, ubiquity in home computing or high-speed internet or the mobile web or GIS or any of these mm. things. And all of a sudden, all of these applications work. Like if somebody came up with Uber in 2001, um, it would have failed because there was no smartphone. Yeah. So anyway, my point, but well, hold on, Peter, my point yeah. is only this, which is that, you know, um, the, the you know, was the dot-com crash really a crash or was it like a blip on, the, on a much larger multi-decade trend of technology kind of eating the world? And, uh, you know, I, I view um, the, the current sort of situation in crypto to be um, indicative of that kind of a trend, not, not of any sort of like question of the health of the industry. Yeah. So even to so I I get you know I get the point. I mean these these asset prices can be very fluctuating and and so it's not necessary. I mean it moved up very fast to three trillion. So even a trillion is is still pretty interesting as a market. I guess maybe then though to to pick on a few pieces like when you see some of these wipeouts like Celsius or 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 Terra Luna, are there things that we're learning about you know some of the specific project? I mean there's many many projects. And we're seeing some projects kind of fail spectacularly. Are, are there lessons you take from some of the specific um, failures? Well, it's a fascinating industry because it's a highly financialized industry, right? Um, because there's a native token for all these different projects. And I think it's easy to get um, these different kinds of things mixed up. So um, something like Terra Luna and UST, UST, maybe just to, to, for the half of the people who aren't super familiar with this stuff, um, probably you, you've heard of a thing called a stable coin. If not, here's a brief definition. A stable coin is a digital asset that is meant to pull the peg to an asset in the real world. Uh, almost always that asset is the US dollar. About 99% of the market capitalization of stable coins uh, are pegged to the US dollar, but there are also Euro stable coins and others. Um, there are different kinds of stable coins. Uh, most of the market cap of stable coins is in a couple of large centralized stable coins, which have assets held in financial institutions. Basically think of them as like money market funds with a native token where you can use it to buy stuff. Um, but there are others that are decentralized. Now within that category, uh, there are another two kinds. There's one that, which are fully or over collateralized. Um, DAI DAI uh, is an example of that. Um, and that is something that's done a great job of holding its peg over many years. And then there's a final category called an algorithmic stable coin, which is designed to um, hold a peg um, even though it is under collateralized, sort of like a fractional reserve banking stable coin. So, you know, if you're familiar with that, um, banks don't have, you know, if a bank takes in a dollar of, uh, of reserves, it might make $10 of loans and it, only, it might only have, you know, 10% sort of equity capitalization. Um, similarly, and, and if everyone decides they want to take their money out of the bank at the same time, the bank will go bankrupt. So Terra uh, UST was similar to that, which is that it was under collateralized. Um, and what happened was effectively was a coordinated bank run um, where uh, someone went to draw, basically to draw down the reserves of the stable coin, and they were unable to defend the peg. And as a result, the whole thing collapsed. Now, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's basically the idea. So why am I telling you this? Uh, UST was a, an experiment in monetary policy gone wrong. And what's interesting about it is that all of the information I just told you, the fact that it was under collateralized, the fact that there was a risk of a bank run was available for everyone to see. It was all in the public domain. What's interesting about these projects is that they're uh, open sourced and uh, transparent. And that didn't stop a bunch of people from believing the hype and believing in the founder. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people lost a lot of money. Um, that is an example of a decentralized project that, um, well, I wouldn't say decentralized, but a sort of a crypto native kind of thing that, mm -hmm. that didn't work out. Um, all of the other issues that we're experiencing in the industry today are not mm -hmm. unique to crypto at all. They're basically just you know hedge funds or shadow banks that got over levered and are blowing up. Um, I don't know how old everyone is on the line, but this is basically what happened in 2008 over and over and over and over and over again. So before the invention of Bitcoin or any other crypto, it's what happened to long-term 
capital management in 1998. So what happened to a lot of banks in the crash of 29, 1907, 1873, like we go, we go back. It's, in it, time. You know, it's closely linked to the shift up in interest rates as well, right? It's it's exposing some of the the, the poorly constructed uh, loan books. Yeah, I think it's. I think that's certainly true. I think the the collapse of a, in, in asset prices across the board, including stocks, has been largely driven by fears of rate rises and and um, you know quantitative tightening. Um, but that's that's sort of like the tide going out, right? To use the the Buffett analogy, yeah. um, the tide's coming out. Now we get to see um, everyone who's swimming naked, um, <laughs> and uh, we're starting to see who's swimming naked. Now, of course, the irony of this entire thing, Peter, is that the projects that are the most troubled in crypto are the most centralized. <laughs> They're just companies. They're companies with opaque loan books that were taking in customer deposits, promising them a certain rate of return. And in order to try and generate that return, they were going out and lending that money uh, to risky uh, borrowers, uh, or they were investing it into DeFi projects that did not have a guaranteed risk-free rate of return. These were speculative investments that they were making. And so when the market tanked, um, either the, the risky borrowers or the risky invest investments weren't able to pay out the depositors who were demanding their funds. This is just a banking crisis um, it, using a, a different kind of asset class. But of course, because of the nature of crypto, it all happens at like an accelerated rate. Now, if you compare the troubles of companies like Voyager, BlockFi and Celsius, these are all shadow bank uh, centralized lending platforms. You contrast their experience with the experience of uh, DeFi protocols like the ones I, I described, Compound, Aave, or even decentralized exchanges. It looks very different. Um, all of those centralized players have had to basically suspend withdrawals or gate users. Um, you know, if, if anyone here is in the hedge fund world, you understand the idea of like basically gating people, preventing them from um, redeeming on, on an investment. Um, and in some cases, they went bankrupt. Voyager, for example, has, has filed for, for bankruptcy because of a huge bad loan it made to a single hedge fund. All of the DeFi projects have never had to gate anybody because that, that's not even how they work. Um, yeah. They're not gateable because no single company or person is in charge, but they do have periods where the loan book has to contract, where people are calling loans, where you know asset prices are declining. So people are getting liquidated on margin, like all of that stuff is still happening. Yeah. And maybe people are losing money on their bad investments, but the company and the project itself remain, or not the company, the project itself remains um, technically and operationally sound. So you might look at the value of these tokens as declining, which is true, or the value uh, locked in them, you know, sort of thinking of that like as deposits in, in these crypto projects going down. Those are signs that interest or, 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 or um, user activity is waning or is declining in the short term, but it's not a sign of the health of the ecosystem. Um, so the problem, the, the problem with this current crypto crisis is not a problem of decentralization. It's actually a problem of too much centralization, which has always been an issue in financial services. You never know, you know, these are what's called like counterparty or Herstad risk, where, you know, you make a loan or you deposit money and you're taking on counterparty risk in that agreement. And we're seeing this play out just once again in a different uh, in market environment. Um, super interesting. Now, one thing it makes me think of, so when we think about the evolution of traditional finance, the fact that it's subject to these problems, um, both in terms of banks blowing up, but also unsophisticated retail investors losing out, it triggers these waves of, of regulation. And so, again, this is a big topic, but maybe, I mean, are you just more basically, do you think the, the current dynamics are accelerating regulation? Um, do you have a general take on, you know, to what extent should we regulate this to protect people versus is that going to squeeze out innovation? Some of those debates. Curious, um, without you know, opening thoughts on on regulation in and and DeFi. Well, I think regulation is an important part of any you know market if you want it to grow and, and be widely used. People need to have um, confidence um, in the thing that they're using now. 
I think that's especially true actually for these centralized intermediaries. You know, once again, like I think DeFi should be um, lightly regulated because this is a, you know, open source technology. And if you try to apply the old rules to the new system, then you might end up harming innovation. But when it comes to these centralized shadow, like shadow banks, they should, they should have been regulated. They should be regulated more stringently. Um, and it's, uh, it's not so much a question of risk because you can take risk in, many different ways you know there's no limit on how many you know call option out of the money call options you can buy tomorrow on gamestop and then blow yourself up and lose all your money we you know the regulators seem to not care about people blowing themselves up and things um which is i'm not saying that's <laughs> what what we should be aiming for in crypto but the issue is one around disclosure like a uh, and and marketing so companies are marketing themselves as you know an alternative to a bank where you can earn 8% interest versus you know 0.5% interest and the marketing uh, pitch is banks are ripping you off well it may be true that banks are behave badly and treat customers um you know like commodities and and that might be true but it might also be true that uh, the reason you're able to generate 8% is that you're taking on greater risk, which in an upward rising okay. environment is is okay. I mean, it conceals the risk, but then when things go down, all of a sudden you, you're unable to generate eight percent. In fact, you might have actually lost people money. Um, so, you know, you cannot be describing yourself if you're a company organized in the United States or France or Singapore, wherever you are. Um, you know, and you're claiming to do something like you actually have to be able to back it up. Um, with uh, you know the proper kind of disclosure, so that would be that would be kind of that would be kind right. of my, my example of regulation. Maybe a little bit soon for the industry have got to gone heavy on Super Bowl and gone out and uh, put, puts a big puts a big uh, target on you for for regulators when you're going that retail. Perhaps yeah, I think that the whole you know getting Giselle and Tom Brady and doing Super Bowl ads, it's a sign of the times. It's like um, you know, lots, lots of during in the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of tech companies were doing the same thing. And, you know, we can look back at a lot of them who did that and point to the ones that failed and say, aha, see hubris, they shouldn't have been spending that money. But, you know, plenty of companies ran Super Bowl ads that are multi-trillion dollar businesses today. So I, I don't know if that's, we'll see how that plays. Out. We'll see how that, that, very good. Um, okay, what I want to do now, let's talk a little bit about your books. And then Sherry, I'm going to go out to you to get some of the audience questions up next. But anyway, just why don't we pull up your current book? But again, this is third book. So obviously co-authored with, with Don, Blockchain Revolution, um, which is hugely successful. And then what I'm interested in, so that was a, like a general book on, on, on blockchain. And then you went off and started really working on, on the financial side with your first book and now the latest digital asset revolution. So curious... Um, you know, what, what partly, I mean, you've been pretty clear about it. What, what drew you to the financial uh, part of the blockchain space? And then really, you know, in the current book, what were the issues that you found interesting that you wanted to understand deeper and, and sort of educate people on? Yeah. Um, well, I've been, so thanks. It's a great question, uh, Peter. I started my career in financial services. So I worked in investment banking for seven years before um taking a big leap of faith to <laughs> and write a book with my dad. I got lucky in my choice to co-author though. Um, you know, as Peter, as you know, Don's um, kind of good at this. Um, so it, it was a great collaboration. Um, but, you know, my, my interest, I mean, I'm fascinated by the potential of, of this technology to change lots of industries, but it's having its greatest impact in financial services. And that's the thing that I'm the most interested in. And so therefore that is the thing that I tend to, to focus on uh, more. And- yeah, Just sorry to interrupt, but it's kind of, I mean, if, if your basic thesis with your dad was, this is the internet of value, you know, yes. where the epicenter of that is likely to be in finance, which is, is value. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the financial industry is more than any one industry. It's the cardiovascular system for the global economy that pumps lifeblood, aka money, into every organ. Um, and without it, you know, the thing dies. So it's it's kind of an important, not to overstate the metaphor, uh, but that's, to, it's a very, it's very important. Um, and, you know, what, what I find really fascinating about this, and, and this has been developing over time, is the emergence of new kinds of digital assets. So I think that the, there's a word that's used widely of uh, cryptocurrency, right? And I think the word cryptocurrency 
is a bit of a misnomer. And I think it's probably done more harm than good for the industry, because I think a lot of people look at a new industry like this that has thousands of digital assets, tokens, that are called currencies and mm -hmm. ask, I think quite rightly, well, why do we need thousands of, of currencies? You know, we, we live in a world today where nation states and, you know, organizations like the EU all have got their own currency and there's hundreds and that, that works terribly with all this friction and all these capital controls and everything. So why, why do we need all these currencies? And the answer is that we don't. And, and that's not what I think a lot of innovators in this industry are trying to do. Um, in fact, in, in our research, and this is something that's expanded over time as the industry has grown, um, we've identified at least nine different kinds of digital assets, um, currencies like Bitcoin being only one of the nine. Um, something like stable coins, for example, which are uh, digital assets tied to dollars are really more just like digital fiat currencies, which I don't, which are, you know, we use the word currency, but they're a little bit different than a cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is a crypto native sort of kind of money. Um, a lot of projects that have their own native token, um, that token functions a lot more like like equity, really. I mean, as at least as a, an investor, if you're buying that, that token, you're buying it uh, most likely because you're speculating on it going up in value. And it goes up in value the more users it, it attracts, the more value it attracts, and so forth, just like a, a startup or a company. Um, there are tokens that are tied to natural assets, things like carbon credits. That's entirely different from a cryptocurrency. There are mm -hmm. NFTs. I think people know about NFTs, right? NFTs are... Um, provably yeah, scarce, yeah. Uh, either unique or, or individual digital assets, things that um, can be used for everything from art and collectibles to, uh, you know, attributes of our identities, which is a really interesting area. So again, like these are all vastly different um, examples of blockchains being used to create scarcity in digital goods. And those digital goods can be any one of these nine different things. They don't need to be money or currencies per se. So trying to create, so in chapter one of this new book, um, Digital Asset Revolution, we describe um, in detail our ta token taxonomy, which are these nine different assets and, and provide numerous examples uh, and some helpful sort of language to, to help people understand the differences between all of them. Um, in the rest of the book, I mean, there's some terrific um, chapters uh, that, um, I, you know, I, I can't go into all of them, but a couple that I think are really, really interesting. One is around uh, prediction markets, which is an important um, mm -hmm. vertical within uh, DeFi. The idea of using um, these decentralized networks to uh, wager on the outcome of future events. That could be everything from, you know, the outcome of an election or a sporting event, if it's for fun, or it could be uh, the outcome of a, a weather event, um, you know, which you can buy as a hedge if you're a farmer, just like a, just like buying futures contracts or, or entering into futures contracts. Um, so there's this really interesting area emerging there. Uh, we did a, an interview with uh, Christian Carlo, who's the former chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which has been repurposed into a chapter about CBDC, central bank digital currencies, which is yet another category of, uh, of digital assets, which is an amazing um, sort of tour de force about, you know, how they work, what they would do, why they're important geopolitically, economically, and so forth. Uh, Chris also happens to be the head of the Digital Dollar Project um, in the United States, so he knows a thing or two about mm -hmm. this. So anyway, the point is the book has got some really great um, content <laughs> for oh, people yeah. trying to understand not just digital assets, but DeFi and these new systems. Well, yeah, I, I, no, I really urge people to, to think in those terms, because again, what's happened is so much space has been taken by Bitcoin and, and the currencies. And then because the prices fluctuate, it get it just drives so much attention. And I think people miss sort of what the underlying, you know, the, the richness of what's actually happening. Um, well, so I think that's that's totally true. But I also think that the, the assets themselves is where the richness is occurring. Like, I think it's hard trying to disassociate uh, digital assets or crypto assets from blockchains um, is is sort of like disassociating the body from the soul in a way. I mean, it's you know, the, there's the manifestation of of blockchain is in creating scarce digital goods. You know, that's just what it is. So um, mm -hmm. that is where the innovation is happening. And you know, even things like Ethereum, probably a lot of people have heard of Ethereum, um, is not really a cryptocurrency, though I think a lot of people would think of it as a cryptocurrency. It is the native token of a computing platform. 
that allows you to build applications. So the more applications that run on that network, on that platform, the more demand there is for the native token and the more valuable it becomes. Not unlike say um, iOS or Google Android, you know, these operating systems where the more applications that get built on the app inside of the Apple sort of walled garden, so to speak, um, the more valuable the, the, the underlying platform becomes. Um, so, you know, it's true that you can use ETH to run applications, to pay for things in the network. And so it sort of has like a monetary like filaments to it, uh, which makes people think it's like a currency, but really it's, um, it's, it's, it's much more than that. Right. And, and I think that's something that, that needs to be understood. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, again, for me, the, the shift here is, is not so much the crypto, but it's really, let's talk about crypto assets, not about yes. cryptocurrencies. Right. And, and at the end of the day, you know, it's not clear that blockchain it's most, it's it, the most, it's not the most performant currency in many ways. Right. So on the other hand, it, it can do really unique, different types of assets like NFT and such. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's right. Maybe I'm, okay. Um, Sherry, we've got questions building up. Um, we have a lot of people uh, in the audience. So over to you. What do you want to start with? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Alex. So we have uh, almost 10 questions already. And I'll just combine some of them because uh, some of the questions are very related. The first two are about regulation. So uh, Alex, so what, what's your view in terms of DeFi and KYC going forward? Do you think regulators will backtrack those who did not have sufficient KYC in place? And another question about regulation is, what's your thoughts on hedge funds enjoying this space because of the lack of regulation? Yeah. And actually maybe uh, just, Alex, to just uh, you know, give a little bit of background on KYC and some of those stuff as, as you get into the more detailed answer. Great. Sure, well, KYC and AML stand for Know Your Customer and Anti-Money Laundering. Um, KYC being sort of the biggest, the biggest sort of condition. Um, every uh, bank and financial institution needs to know who their customer is by law. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting question as it relates to DeFi. If something is truly decentralized and um, has no sort of management team or head office or domicile, domicility, or if, that, if that's a word, yeah. or um, you know some kind of organization, a company, a foundation, whatever, that a regulator can go after, I think it will be hard to enforce those terms. But I think that a lot of, um, if you think of this industry, a lot of these decentralized finance projects start with a founding team who have gotten together either in a place or online and work to build it out together. Now, I think in a lot of instances, they are genuinely decentralized. I think, you know, things like Ethereum and Bitcoin and Cosmos and, you know, IBC is another sort of platform. These things are decentralized. Uh, but a lot of like individual DeFi projects um, are what they call um, dinos, right? So for Amer our American friends, you might remember the term rhino, Republican in name only, um, to describe people who were like against Donald Trump. It was used as an insult by the right wing. Um, dinos are decentralized in name only, right? Which is like, call yourself a protocol or a lab <laughs> or something, and all of a sudden you're you're exempt from KYC. So I think that probably we'll see regulators try and identify platforms that they can regulate um, that have a, a thing that they can go after, right? You have to have a thing that you can go mm -hmm. after, um, which, which is what makes these sort of shadow lenders such low hanging fruit. And I think probably they'll start there before trying to untangle the whole DeFi space. Um, but that will probably ex uh, accelerate the, um, the decentralization of a lot of these different kinds of of organizations or, or, or cause them to migrate to decentralized platforms. So I don't know exactly. But what I do know is that um, putting aside the, you know, they don't want to do KYC. Well, actually, in a lot of instances, you do want to do it because you may want to be engaging regulated financial institutions in your marketplace. And that sort of mm -hmm. goes to question number two, which is, you know, are institutional investors, hedge funds or, or whomever uh, reluctant to get into DeFi because they're worried about their counterparty, for example, being, you know, someone who mm. they don't want to be doing business with, you know, who knows who they, that person might be. Um, so uh, I think that there's a, there's a, there's a demand drive. There's a bit, there's a business use case for uh, regulated DeFi uh, to attract 
uh, regulated financial institutions. And so there's lots of stuff going on in that space today already. Um, there are, you know, segregated pools. So segregated sort of uh, like you take the, the code base for like Uniswap or whatever, and then you 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 fork it, you do re rebuild it, and then you create some gating requirements that require people to do KYC to access that liquidity, for example. And I think that you're going to see more and more of that uh, institutional or regulated DeFi uh, get built out in the future. In terms of just buying crypto assets and speculating on Bitcoin and Ether, honestly, I think the majority of hedge funds uh, can do that. And many of them are doing that. Uh, you know, I mean, you can look at, um, like have a conversation with, like, as I do through my business with some of the leading uh, institutional platforms, and they'll tell you that their client base includes tons of different Wall Street firms and hedge funds, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies and the like. So I do think that uh, that's kind of already happening. But for, for those uh, institutions to go fully into the DeFi space, where they're really, they're not, they're not interacting with Coinbase or Gemini as a counterparty uh, or Genesis or one of these companies, but rather with Uniswap or Aave, um, I think for a lot of them, at least to feel comfortable, they'll need to have some minimum level of, of regulation in place. Yeah. And I think that, you know, people will, should, can and should build off of that so that they can drive that new, those new market participants and liquidity to those, to those platforms. So yeah, it'll, uh, what I hear you saying, it potentially separate true DeFi from not. So like the Coinbase's and Binance that are actually more centralized, they're going to feel the heat. They're going to really face a choice. Do we want to go fully legit and get regulated or not? Well, most of those, I mean, not most, but like lots of them are like, let's not forget, like Coinbase is a publicly listed company. It trades in the New York Stock Exchange. To my knowledge, they're not engaged in any disputes, you know, on, on the regulatory side, um, you know, and there are lots of other centralized companies, Circle, for example, um, that are, uh, you know, American enterprises in good standing with their regulators that have all the requirements. So like, let's not think that everybody operating in the space is some like, you know, um, sort of shoot from the hip kind of player. But there are lots that are like that. So that that's, you know, the, the reputation is not totally unjustified, but there are lots that are not like that. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think that probably if you want to be a big centralized exchange, you do need to grow up at a certain point and become, you know, a regulated entity. Um, and we'll see how some of the ones that are, have avoided that reconcile with this new reality. We'll see. Sherry, next topic. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so the next topic will be the comparison between traditional banks and also the uh, digital assets. So we have two questions on this topic. Uh, the first one is if the banks can have been more involved in the crypto, would it be such a three times decline and crypto winter? Uh, do you have any, uh, like, what's your thoughts about this? And another question is about, like, for banks, they can grant loans and they can ask for collectibles. But actually, for uh, crypto or for digital assets, there's no such, like, uh, real collectible. And how do we increase the digital credit as stable coins? So what's your thoughts on this, Alex? Um, so question number two, I'd love to answer. Um, question number one, I didn't quite understand. So it was what was it about bank adoption of, of crypto? Do you mind just repeating the first the first question? Yeah, sure, I'll just repeat. So the first yeah. one is, in your opinion, if banks would have been more involved in the crypto, would it be such a three times decline and crypto winter? Could have they been able to stabilize the situation? Ah, interesting. Um, I think that, so, this crypto winter, you know, could already be thawing or it could be on its, you know, going into a deep freeze like Game of Thrones. I, I really don't know. Um, but I don't know that, you know, any single, first of all, I don't think any mainstream banks at this stage have any interest or willingness to get involved to, to stabilize the market. And certainly the government has no interest in doing that either. Uh, not, un not unless it starts to spill over into other other parts of the economy and poses a systemic risk, which at this point, I don't think it does. So who does that leave? Well, at this stage, you know, the only people willing to backstop the market are, are wealthy individuals or, or individual or companies. And I actually wrote an op-ed about this for Fortune Magazine uh, last week, where I uh, compared the current crisis to the panic of 1907. And today there's um, a well-known crypto entrepreneur, um, the short hand is SBF, um, who is, uh, 
stepped into the same role that Jay Pierpont Morgan stepped into in 1907. Um, you know, before the introduction of the Federal Reserve Bank, um, and really before the, you know, the government became so enormous and centralized, um, individual citizens often sort of were acted as the lender of last result, resort for the financial system. And that was true in, in 1873 with Cornelius Vanderbilt, and it was true in 1907 with J.P. Morgan. Now, he alone didn't backstop it, but he was the person who coordinated a private public partnership uh, to, to help rescue the financial system. Um, I think that today we're seeing uh, a similar sort of history rhyming or repeating. Now, the question is, um, you know, markets can stay rational longer than you can stay solvent. That's John Maynard Keynes. And, and the question is, you know, can these, is there enough liquidity in, in these individual um, entities to, you know, act as a lender of last resort or will the pressure of the markets declining, and I don't just mean crypto, but the whole collapse that we've seen um, eventually dry them out. I don't know the answer to that. We'll, we'll see. Um, question number two, uh, I thought, um, you know, was was totally fascinating. And, uh, oh, now I remember what it was. <laughs> okay, so, so um, the question is, it's hard to, to do collateral. So banks have the ability to collect, um, you know, if you get access to a loan. And even if it's an unsecured loan, like say a credit card loan or something, they still know who you are, where you live, they know your credit score, you know that you know if you don't repay, the credit bureau is going to ding you. And so there's all these sort of things that kind of penalize individuals um, who are taking out loans. Um, in lending, there's sort of two things. There's the ability to pay and the willingness to pay, uh, which are really important for a bank. Because frankly, a bank wants to not just lend to people who have the ability to repay, but a willingness to repay, which is to say like a habit of paying back. Because if you think about it, if an individual defaults on their mortgage and the bank has to seize the house as collateral and then has to go sell it, that's a loss for the bank because it's not just about the financial, maybe they make, even they make money, but the fact that they've got to engage so many people and processes and handling a default of a single house, they would much rather the person just pay the loan. They don't want to have to deal with that. So this idea of willingness and ability to repay are extremely important in lending. Now in crypto, um, you might think, well, so you've got these people connecting through these platforms and they don't know who, each, who they, who they are. And one person is, you know, getting access to a loan. Like, what gives the lender any confidence that they're going to repay? Um, well, the, the reason, the way in which DeFi overcomes this is simply that all DeFi loans are uh, collateralized, over collateralized loans. Okay, so um, the best example of this in the real world, and I mentioned, I alluded to it briefly earlier, is a margin account. So just like I'm sure everyone knows what that is, but you know, margin account basically is you've got an account with a brokerage where you have a bunch of securities, stocks and bonds or whatever. And because you've got all this collateral sitting inside of these firms, you can borrow against it. Uh, just like you can borrow against your house with a home equity line of credit or a mortgage, for example. And you can borrow up to a certain amount. But if you've got a dollar of stocks, you can't borrow $10. You can borrow maybe 50 cents or 75 cents or something like that, depending on whatever. Um, so similarly with crypto, if you post collateral to DeFi protocol, uh, you can get a loan, but you can't get a loan for the entire amount. You get a loan for less. And it's actually less than a margin account because the underlying asset is so volatile. So you would end up just getting liquidated all the time if you were borrowing like 80 cents on the dollar. So this has led to the criticism of DeFi that it doesn't actually export any sort of economic value outside of the crypto asset economy. Um, so people are taking tokens, getting collateral in, getting a loan in tokens, and then using those tokens to buy other tokens. And it's like a big merry-go-round. Well, that's not entirely true. Um, lots of individuals might choose to, you know, use these protocols to get access to stable coins, which can be used like dollars to pay for parts of, you know, whatever, pay for their lifestyle without having to liquidate their underlying assets. It's something rich people do all the time. Nobody ever sells shares in anything. They just borrow against them because why take the capital gains tax? Um, and so there's lots of value, I think, being exported in that respect. But the, to me, the holy grail of DeFi, it's like a very long-winded way of answering this question, is to figure out, and if anybody's working on this, who's on this call, please talk to me, uh, is a credit score for the DeFi space. So the idea of basically creating, and we talked about this in blockchain revolution six years ago, 
which as we said, you are your credit score. That was the name of a section in my chapter on financial services. And the idea was all of this economic activity that you engage on, it's all on chain, right? It's all recorded in a way that's immutable, people can trust. So it can become part of your persistent digital identity. And maybe you can use that as a way to uh, you know, unlock serve act and access services like like financial services when maybe you couldn't before maybe you're a bad credit according to you know equifax but um your on-chain activity says otherwise and you can use that as a way to get access to more financial services so to me the idea of an of an on-chain or a DeFi credit score that can be used for um peer-to-peer Un unsecured lending where you're basically securing it against your identity and uh you know in the same way that if you don't repay a loan your identity your, your credit score can go down maybe there's a way to integrate um this concept from crypto called slashing where basically like if you don't if you don't repay the loan then your your crypto credit score would get slashed it would basically you'd lose some value and maybe that's not economic value maybe that's reputational value anyway this is like an idea that I don't think anybody's doing yet well, but if you could figure it out, if someone can figure out how to do a DeFi credit score for regular retail lending and regular retail financial services, not just high value crypto lending, which is what it is now, then you would be able to basically create a multi-trillion dollar marketplace um, in DeFi and make it mainstream. So any students or any alums who are thinking about this no seriously like there have been there were some identity projects that came about in 2017 18 in the sort of ico cycle that were looking at ways to create sort of a form of digital id online and you know none of them have been able to to crack the nut it's an uncracked nut and inside of the nut is lots of money so if you've got an answer to this question let me know <laughs> let us know that's an awesome awesome lead on an idea clearly a hard one to crack but a big nut if you could do it let me, um, Jerry, I'm going to ask you for one last question in a second. I just want to follow up on the first part, though, on, on the relationship between DeFi and traditional incumbent financial institutions. Um, so classically, if something's really disruptive, time and time again, we see that often the incumbents have trouble embracing it. Um, on the other hand, over time, incumbents try and get better and better and not get disrupted. Do you have like just a, a short thought on what do you think the relationship is going to be between DeFi and traditional financial institutions? Is it purely competition or is there gonna be some uh, collaboration there? What's what's your sense where this is going? I think DeFi is, is the bleeding edge of, of crypto asset innovation in, in financial services. But there's lots of other examples where banks are actually naturally suited to get involved in this mm -hmm. space. Uh, one is around custody. So um, banks, so there are banks and some other financial institutions are the largest custodians of securities and other financial assets in the world. Uh, you know, banks like, like BNY Mellon or US Bank, these are the biggest custodial banks in the world. And digital asset custody is actually a really big problem. Um, it's true that lots of people want to you know be their own bank and and store assets themselves and interact with these things peer to peer and not ever have to touch a financial institution but that's still probably the minority of people <laughs> and yeah. and it's probably age dependent you know i think a lot of younger people are probably more comfortable doing that than than their uh, than their parents but even amongst young people like not everyone wants to be thinking about their assets and their money every moment of the day you know so i think there's a role for institutions with um you know that, that already have customer relationships and um it's depending on where they are have some level of trust to step into this market and so we've seen actually banks like bny mellon us bank um you know becoming uh really active players in the in the crypto asset custody they're only white labeling someone else's service. They're not actually building it themselves. They're using this company called Fireblocks, um, and you know they 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 work with other partners. But at least they recognize or acknowledge that this is a market opportunity. Um, you know, the creating uh, ETF or fund products for people to invest in this asset class, I think, is another way that traditional financial firms can um, get involved. That's what we've done. We have a 
Bitcoin ETF, the nine point Bitcoin ETF, BITC, it trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange. It's one of the world's first and is the only carbon neutral Bitcoin ETF in the world. Um, so that's another example of something that people can do. Um, there are, is, you know, building out exchange capacity. Um, so, you know, harnessing the power of DeFi and decentralized exchanges and applying it to other financial assets. If you're, you know, a cap bank with a large capital markets business, um, that's a huge opportunity, not, not a challenge, right? So, Very clear. So to me, mm -hmm. there, are, there are at least as many, or there are, there are, men, there are many ways that a bank can uh, re-intermediate itself. Um, there are probably more, it'll probably, more ways that will get disintermediated, but there are plenty of ways that you can like, you know, capture value from changing technology paradigms. And that's like, lots of firms have done that in the past. Okay, we're down to the five minute mark. Sherry, one last pointed question. And then, and then Alex and I will start wrapping up. What do you yeah, got? Yeah, because of the time limit, maybe I'll just choose a very short one. Yeah. So Alex, what's your favorite uh, DeFi protocol? Any idea on this? Well, <laughs> this is not investment advice. Um, <laughs> you know, I, for a very long time, I've been a supporter of, um, of the Cosmos community, um, you know, Cosmos is, um, and, and it's called IBC is the sort of the, 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 the community itself at, at large. Um, and, and the reason for that is that it uh, allows any application to build its own blockchain and then to use the shared security of the network to make sure that you know, the blockchain operates okay. Versus like building on top of platforms or being stuck in one single tech silo. And to me, that's really important because interoperability is going to be a really key um, feature going forward. Because otherwise, all of these different DeFi protocols are going to be stuck in silos using these things called bridges to connect. And these bridges can be risky, frankly. Um, and so within the Cosmos ecosystem, um, there's a, you know the wallet application there's called Kepler. It's sort of like MetaMask, if people are familiar with, with Ethereum. And the, um, the decentralized exchange in that ecosystem is called Osmosis. Um, it's one of the top 10 largest uh, DeFi protocols by protocol revenue and is the sort of uh, application, uh, it is the exchange for this application universe. So if you think this application universe is going to grow and more and more people are going to want to use these tools, there's going to need to be a, you know, native sort of platform for trading those, those assets and engaging in those um, different applications. And so that's where I think Osmosis, um, you know, I think stands to benefit. I think in general though, DeFi not investment advice, just a comment on a project. Um, <laughs> and DeFi in general, though, I think is, um, you know, undervalued relative to, to its potential and, and what it has been able to show during this crisis. I think that if you look at the, the values of a lot of um, DeFi tokens, including Ethereum-based ones, um, they have struggled um, more even than their peers have. Um, they peaked two years ago. <laughs> and so I think that they're probably due for a resurgence as people you know, begin to realize the value that they unlock. Cool. Um, we got two minutes to wrap up, Alex. Maybe just any short advice for some of the different personas on the call. So again, people, you know, any words of encouragement for those in the DeFi space, um, maybe though also some of the people maybe in the tech space who are thinking about joining um, blockchain and DeFi type projects. Anyway, just any uh, things you want to share uh, with the community? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, bull markets are for earning and uh, bear markets are for learning. This is a time, <laughs> this is a time when, you know, if prices are going to be range bound for a while, mm -hmm. um, how else can you create value, right? If it's not purely financial value, well, maybe it's by becoming educated, um, you know, or starting the thing that you uh, have always thought about starting. Um, it's almost cliche at this point, but a lot of great businesses are founded during economic downturns. Um, that's been the case for like a hundred years. And uh, even, even in the crypto space during the last sort of crypto winter, we saw the rise of DeFi and alternative platforms to Ethereum and NFTs and all these other things. So um, I think we'll see that again here. Um, so I, I would say, you know, if you're, if you're trying to think of how you, to become educated, I would strongly encourage you to check out the um, specialization on Coursera uh, but that uh, NCAD and the BRI uh, partnered with together, uh, Blockchain for the Enterprise and also for Financial Services. Um, it's we have been... a new one coming out on uh, supply chain with FedEx. So yeah, a whole set of things.
Oh, we're gonna pull up even, we must even have a slide, so cool. Yeah, so anyway, I, I interrupted you. So yes, you should certainly check out our, our blockchain specialization. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, we've got a new one coming. Uh, over 100,000 people have taken this. This is the most popular non-technical uh, blockchain course on Coursera today. So for everyone who's got a business background and wants to learn this stuff, this is a great place to start. And then, you know, Digital Asset Revolution, this new book that we're putting out, uh, I do believe is the most current, uh, most forward-looking, um, you know, book that's that's out in the, in the market today, at least, uh, that gives you, you know, perspective on, on this industry. So I encourage you to check that out too. Okay, Alex, uh, I think we could have easily gone another hour to, to probe this. Um, fascinating area, incredibly broad command of the topic. And um, thank you for coming out to share, sharing. Sherry, thank you for uh, voicing the questions from our audience. Thank you everyone for, for being here and engaging with us. Um, have a great end of the week. Thanks for having me. Thanks. So.